I'm not anti anything. I don't want what I'm experiencing to have some sort of political bend. I just want my story out there so I and others like me can get the help that we are entitled to. This is not political. This is a human issue. And many other people are getting sick and no one is willing to step up and help us. And so it's usually someone says like, oh, really, which one did you have? And I'll say, oh, I got Pfizer. Oh, that's strange. My husband got that one. He's fine. I'm like, yeah. And so did a lot of my family members. And they're all totally fine. But some people are not fine. And by the time I got to my car, I noticed that my face was burning and tingling. I can't feel my face. The first time I said those words was 10 months ago. The last time I said those words was two months ago. But I'm one of the lucky ones. I, I went to the emergency room probably 15 times. I was a father. I'm a 16-year-old son. My government lied to me. They said it was safe. The vaccines are safe, I promise you. They are safe and effective. The president promised a safe and effective vaccine in record time, and President Trump delivered. These are safe and effective. Vaccines are safe, effective, and free. I have facial paresthesia and nerve pain for the last five months. Paresthesia is a word that I'd never heard of a year ago. But now, it wakes me up every morning. Severe, painful paresthesias, which are burning, tingling. The people who are not getting vaccines, who are believing the lies on the internet instead of science, it's time to start shaming them. What else? Or leave them behind. One word describes how I felt in the first few months after my diagnosis. Abandoned. <laughs> <clears throat> I did what I was asked, got harmed, and there's no program in place for me. I was fighting doctors trying to get them to listen to what was happening to her because nobody else was researching. I have reported my symptoms to VSAFE, VAERS, CDC, FDA, Pfizer. They say we have a small percentage, but how do they truly know what the percentage is when they won't even acknowledge that we exist? So she will not acknowledge it. If I talk about it, she changes the subject. They don't understand, like, yes, I look fine on the outside, but not in the inside, not what I'm feeling, not the vibrations, the muscle twitching, the fatigue. When are we going to stop putting up with the idiots in this country and just say it's mandatory to get vaccinated? After six weeks of neurological reactions from the vaccine, I began to share my experience with people. I was shamed. Oh, you can't shame them. You can't call them stupid. You can't call them silly. Yes, they are. I was told that I was ethically and morally irresponsible because sharing my story could sway people away from getting vaccinated. Let me be clear. I am pro-vaccine. We are pro-vaccine and pro-science. And I have always vaccinated my kids. I've always been vaccinated myself. As a health professional, I understand the danger of creating vaccine hesitancy. Vaccines have saved countless lives, but you cannot erase people who are harmed. We supported the vaccine. We're not irrational, we're not ignorant. We're just a group of people whose lives have drastically changed because of this, and we're not included in the mainstream dialogue. And it turns out the primary freedom they want is the freedom to be stupid. I'm listening to Dr. Fauci. I don't have to listen to a million people. Just listen to him. I represent science. And if you're attacking me, you're really attacking science. I mean, everybody knows that. Many people who've had this experience have been silenced because we're told that our story is not significant because we are merely anecdotals. But FDA officials instead told us, oh, these stories a.k.a. my life, um, are just anecdotes. Well, when you're the person who is harmed, it is your 100%. I've been observing it, and I can't deny observation. That's how science happens initially through observation. And then we confirm through hypothesis, experiment, and data. My data is anecdotal. My observational group is significant, but we need additional studies to happen. I listened to all the people that you're going to hear today. And in my opinion, the stories that you will hear are more plausible than the fanciful explanations you might also hear. This spring, when the current administration was urging young, healthy Americans to get vaccinated to help end this war on the pandemic, I stepped up because my country asked me to. In June, I joined the rapidly growing number of young men who developed pericarditis post-mRNA vaccine. That is the inflammation of the liner surrounding the heart. 
That condition, along with POTS and reactive arthritis, have completely brought an end to life as I knew it. I have been bedridden, unable to work, and unable to exercise for months. I'm not asking you to end the vaccine program by any means. All I'm asking is for some transparency and acknowledgement of what is happening. We need to set up a fund with a portion of vaccine proceeds to help heal and study injured Americans and compensate the families who have lost loved ones due to complications of the vaccine. I'm asking you human to human, please do the right thing and help us. We're here to tell our stories, ones largely ignored and silenced, and we hope that you listen, and we hope that you ask questions. Today, I am 18 months from my one Pfizer shot, and I still wake up every morning with varying levels of numbness and electrical shocks throughout my body. They subside in about an hour or two, and the rest of the day is random stinging pinpricks and numbness that comes and goes. The unfortunate politicization surrounding COVID vaccine has thrust me into an intense journey. A year ago, I had a basic trust in the CDC, NIH, and government health officials. I trusted the basic facts that came from my reliable left-wing news outlets. Now, I do not. Now, I question everything that I thought I knew. With this movie, my goal is to add nuance so that we might come together in humanity instead of division. Not by agreeing on the answers, but by agreeing on the questions. It's been over nine months since she got her second dose. She can't walk. She's in a wheelchair. I just want to give everybody a, little, a better idea of what happens in a trial, because I did not know. When you enter the trial, um, everybody uses a trial app. The app only allows you to record solicited adverse events, fever, redness, mild, moderate. There's no free form to fill in any other reaction that you have. What you have to do if you have any other type of adverse event is you have to call the study doctor. This leaves a lot of room for human error and concern of reporting bias coming from the principal investigator. The principal investigator for Maddie's trial is the lead author for the New England Journal of Medicine article. What made it into the trial record is unclear. There's no mention of Maddie's adverse reactions in that article. In the EUA amendment, Maddie's adverse reaction was reduced to five lines that was eventually diagnosed as functional abdominal pain. By the data cutoff for the trial, Maddie experienced over 35 adverse events. None of these were mentioned in either document. Maddie was in the hospital when the EUA was approved. I thought that Maddie would be in the best hands possible, and the rare chance she had a severe reaction that was not the case. They did everything in their power to hide everything. Neither Pfizer, the FDA, or the CDC has ever talked to us. A year ago, I received my COVID vaccine when I gladly signed up for a clinical trial here in the United States with AstraZeneca. I was assured that if something were to go wrong, there would be protocols in place to provide a safety net that the data would be collected and the benefits as well as the risks would be assessed and disclosed to the public. The pharmaceutical company agreed to pay any medical expense as a result of a possible injury. We have had to refinance our home to pay for our medical expenses. Like Maddie's trial, we had a tracking app. Like Maddie's trial, our tracking app had pre-designated symptoms in a bullet list with no free form to add any other symptoms the clinical trial report published by the New England Journal of Medicine says the second dose is required to continue in a study. Because my reaction was so severe, I was not allowed to get the second dose. This is different than what is found in the report, which says that these individuals chose to forego the second dose. The clinical trial report also says serious adverse events will be recorded through day 730. I last heard from them on day 60. I am almost at day 365. That is 10 months of critical safety data gone. The heads of the NIH, FDA, and CDC have known firsthand about my case and thousands of others. They know that their lack of acknowledgement has recreated created insurmountable barrier to our ability to receive medical care from doctors who rely on these agencies for information. They know about the issues with the clinical trials. They know about the deaths. They know about the lack of follow-up on VAERS. They know about the injuries to children. They know about Maddie. I have discussed Maddie with them.
They know about the suicides as the results of months-long suffering. They know about the aggressive censorship. We did video conferences with Peter Marks and Janet Woodcock, constant emails with Janet Woodcock and myself directly. FDA's done everything to ensure that the COVID-19 vaccines we've authorized have met the agency's high standards for quality, safety, and effectiveness. We train students on how to go beyond a study abstract and start to pick apart and critically assess biomedical studies, not just take them at face value. Everybody knows that COVID vaccines save lives. The clinical trials proved that to be the case. But is it true? The evidence is flimsy. The trials did not show a reduction in death. And you can see that there were similar numbers of deaths in the vaccine and placebo groups, even for COVID deaths, with just two deaths in the placebo group versus one in the vaccine group. My point is not that I know the truth about what the vaccine can and cannot do. My point is that those who claimed the trials showed the vaccines were highly effective in saving lives were wrong. The trials did not demonstrate this. All of the vaccines that received emergency use approval by FDA went through that process and were judged to be safe and effective. That's about the most rigorous evaluation that's ever been done of a vaccine. So you should feel very comfortable. I don't think people realize that all these people who had COVID were excluded from the trials. What's going to happen to the 16 children, 16 million children who've already had the virus, who already have immunity, and we're going to subject them to something that wasn't even tested in that group. Now from the clinical trials and real world data, some 6 billion shots being given out around the world, that it is a safe and effective vaccine. I was working on Pfizer's trial. What I saw was like nothing I've ever seen before. The speed in which they were enrolling in the study, four to five coordinators pushing through 40, 50, 60 patients a day. We were not storing the vaccine at its appropriate temperature. The failures in reporting serious adverse events. We had so many reports of adverse events. Again, we just could not keep up. The study doctor signed a physical exam when he wasn't even in clinic. Ventavia had unblinded every patient that was randomized in the trial. When we brought it to their attention, that's what we were instructed to do, remove the evidence and destroy it. Emails about mislabeled blood specimens. Per Pfizer's protocol, we should have immediately stopped enrolling but they never told Pfizer. I would bring the concerns to my managers and it was more understaffed. The FDA, they only see what Pfizer gives them. So I was documenting all of this. And on the 25th of September, I went directly to the FDA and about six and a half hours later, I, I lost my job. I was fired. We undertook a rigorous and thorough review of these uh, scientific data. We're confident that this can be used in this population. Obviously, we will continue to monitor the safety. And obviously, the, the safety looks really, really good. I support vaccines, and I've been vaccinated myself. But I do have concerns about research integrity and the process used to authorize, approve, and mandate vaccines during this emergency. Among 72 studies on the Pfizer vaccine that are registered in clinicaltrials.gov, only one uh, is shown to have been completed, and zero. That's right, zero studies have reported their results publicly. So while we're told to keep following the science, what we are following is not a scientific process based on open data. We're following a process in which the data are treated as secret. And in my view, there's something very unscientific about that. It's not science if you can't see the data, and you cannot see the data from Pfizer trials. We've got these amazing 2,500 volunteers, people highly credentialed, uh, medical researchers, doctors and nurses, pouring over these 55,000 documents that a court order forced Pfizer and the FDA to release. Well, they're finding that there were horrible harms deaths, spontaneous abortions, neurological problems, fainting, heart damage, um, muscle, debilitating muscle pain, debilitating joint pain that were concealed by Pfizer and the FDA from the American people. 
So I'm 22 years old. I was studying at Chestnut Hill College. I was vaccinated in the summer and wasn't able to return. I'm applying for social security income. My legs have been not working for three hours now. I started having tingling in my face. And then I started developing GI issues, often on ringing in the ears. My normal resting heart rate was like in the 50s and 60s. It stays in the 70s and 80s now. My resting heart rate just sitting was over 100. I just felt something wrong on the left side of my chest. It started feeling like tighter and bigger. And I just like, uh, maybe I should just get this, this thing checked out. So I ended up going to the ER and then they, they diagnosed me with the uh, pericarditis. I started having internal tremors, which is the most terrifying thing. It started in my right leg and then it went into my torso. And you could just feel my body just shaking. I don't think I've cried so much in my life. I was on my mom's couch for like two to three months. She stood with me because she was so afraid that something was going to happen to me. Burning and numbness all the way from my toes, like to my hands. My daughter even had to like hold me up because I had no strength in my legs. And not every day is great. Like right now, currently, I have no strength in my arms. I lost my ability to speak naturally. I have become unable to walk without a walker and never know if or when the tremors will come or go. I can no longer cook, clean, or even pick up and hold my baby for too long before my body begins to shake uncontrollably or is thrown into excruciating amounts of pain, seeing countless ER doctors as well as two neurologists who have given me no diagnoses, no further testing besides regular blood work, CT scans, EEGs, EKGs, and an MRI all of which the doctors told me came back normal. Another CT scan, an MRI of my brain, a lumbar puncture, the test came back normal. Yeah, I'm being seen as the best hospital around. They couldn't find anything. They just denied everything. It wasn't the vaccine, it's not the vaccine. So then I'm sitting there and I'm talking to the doctors and then just out of nowhere, I started getting like these like, felt like my cells were popping and exploding inside my body. I was in the hospital for four days. On the fourth day, the doctor came in, he sat down beside me, he goes, we've done every test. Nothing's come back, you know, abnormal. I did go to a neurologist three times looking for help. Um, eventually did a brain MRI, did labs. All of those were normal. In the ER, of course, everything checked out. He's my older brother and uh, love the guy to death and beyond. He used to be able to, like, outpace me sprinting for the bus every single time he would win. We really have to uh, be around him all, all the, the time. time. Yeah. I can't, we can't leave him in the house alone. Um, and... Once, since we moved him downstairs, um, you know, we, we, we sleep downstairs too. Yeah. Because we don't know he could fall out of bed and not be able to, um, uh, you know, tell anybody. It's difficult to talk about. I don't, I try not to think about how I feel about it. Um, because when I do, it becomes, uh, very emotional for me. I can't go there. Yeah. And, um, I can't go there. Before all of this happened to me, I had what I consider a dream life. All I had to do was just keep it going. I've lost my career, lost my health, lost my savings. I am an unemployed paraplegic who's learning an entire new lifestyle. And the only thing I did between full health and my current condition is take a shot. My life has dramatically changed after this adverse reaction. My career of 19 years, excuse me, that I took almost 14 years to train for <clears throat> is likely over. I'm just not safe to work as an orthopedic surgeon. Assuming the FDA and the CDC would be alarmed at my diagnosis, I expected to be contacted soon after my VAERS submission. No phone call, no contact. VAERS is an early warning system to detect possible safety problems in U.S. licensed vaccines, co-managed by the CDC and FDA. Not a single doctor I saw logged me in VAERS. All my reports are my own. The other common theme is that they submitted a VAERS report. 
that they had to do it and often their physicians didn't. I then contacted the CDC myself. They acknowledged my various submission but stated my reaction was categorized as not serious as I had not been hospitalized and I hadn't died. I have had patients go to the hospital and the hospital was like, this is probably from the vaccine. And it was never reported. All the energy that's gonna be put into reporting to VAERS, yeah. is it gonna to count towards anything? VAERS is a passive reporting system, meaning that VAERS reports can be submitted voluntarily by anyone. On the VAERS website, it states, under reporting, is one of the main limitations of passive surveillance systems, including VAERS. Somebody called me. They said they were from CDC VAERS. And at the end of the call, they basically said, you won't hear from us again. This is merely for our reporting. And that's kind of how I was left. Well, let's remember what VAERS was designed to do. It really wasn't designed to look at whether or not the vaccine caused an adverse event. For example, uh, people choose what they want to report to VAERS. So there are some reporting biases and other potential limitations that don't allow VAERS to determine whether or not the reported adverse event was caused by the vaccine. Although VAERS reporting is subjective and flawed, data can be analyzed as a way to note disturbing trends that may warrant careful attention. Such as the fact that there are more reported adverse events for the COVID shots than for all other vaccines combined since they started tracking this data in 1990. VAERS to this day has never called me. I have nothing. Give me something to do. Tell me how to get better. People are asking for help, and the people who are in charge are like, you guys don't exist. When I mention my reaction to the COVID vaccine, I'm met with silence. Rarely do people ask questions, unless they ask, are you sure it was the vaccine? Let me be clear. I had a real adverse event. My symptoms are real, and my life for ever has changed. When did the burden of proof become our responsibility? Shouldn't it fall on the companies or health agencies who are claiming their product is safe? And how do I prove it to you? What would you accept? The countless medical labs that show nothing? If you're wondering how to know if these reactions are real, I ask you, how do you know they're not real? So much ugliness and bitterness from people who know just the surface of what's happened to me after this vaccine. It has become the loneliest and most isolating experience I've had in my 35 years of life. We went to the emergency room and I insisted that they check his head. And that's when we found blood clots in his brain. His risk of death from one of those thromboses becoming a catastrophic event, some of the doctors have hypothesized it was greater than 90%. So we sat there in the ICU, basically hoping Everest would not die because there was very little they could do. They did tests on Everest from Black Plague <laughs> to HIV, they tested him for HIV twice, and they never thought to look really hard at the vaccine. They really dismissed it. They, in fact, when I would push them, I actually had one of the physicians say, why are you being so combative? And I said, because the symptoms started the night of his shot. The doctors can't find anything wrong with you. So then they're like, oh, this must be psychological. They even tried to admit her to a mental hospital. There was a lot of questioning if I was crazy. Other people had the vaccine and they had side effects and they came back. I could not wait to pee. I'm like, I just want to give you my urine so you see that I'm not using cocaine like to keep accusing me of. I have been called a liar and a fake and I have even been told by the ER doctors that this is all in my head. They called a social worker to have me evaluated and tried to have me committed to Western State Mental Health Hospital. I have to fight to be believed and not written off as anxious. Until public health authorities acknowledge these injuries, you can't seek treatment. I was and still am pro-science and pro-vaccine. The main issue rests squarely on the fact that the FDA, CDC, and NIH refuse to acknowledge that real lives are being absolutely destroyed by this vaccine. We all go in there thinking we're not going to be in that 1% of people who get harmed. But a lot of people don't know when it doesn't go well, you cannot sue. There's no vaccine injury hospital for you and there's no one researching you, that small percentage is a terrible place to be.
I've had six spinal taps over eight months, missed nearly an entire year of my life and part of my children's lives. My family and I are on the verge of losing everything we have. It was my understanding that the federal government accepted the responsibility of helping people injured by this vaccine. You can't sue Pfizer, J&J, or Moderna for any of the injuries. You're relegated to a program called CICP, which has a standard of proof that makes it almost impossible to obtain compensation, and the amount of compensation is, is de minimis for the most part. My doctor called me at home and wouldn't give me an exemption. And she said, but I believe you had an adverse reaction. I've been seeing you, and you should not get a second shot, but I'm not doing exemptions and I won't even report it was an adverse reaction because that's how afraid she is that the medical board's gonna... I've also asked my primary care physician for an exemption four times, and I live in Boise, Idaho, and yeah, the network there basically told her, under no circumstance are you allowed to get an exemption. It has become de facto impossible to get a medical exemption for a COVID vaccine in the state of California. I received a letter from the California State Medical Board saying, any physician in California who writes an inappropriate exemption will have his medical license subjected to investigation and disciplinary action. Their licenses have been threatened. And because their licenses have been threatened, we cannot get medical care. I've seen emails where hospitals threaten their doctors. You cannot sign medical exemptions. You cannot talk about, you cannot report adverse reactions to these vaccines. And if somebody was actually brave enough to do that on writing, there were other people higher up to erase those. I have the proof and I have the people that have shown me these things. But it takes a brave doctor yeah. to say, yes, if I believe my patient is having a reaction, I'll give them an exemption. There is one other doctor that I know who is like, I'm going to... I'm going to protect my patients. I'm going to stand up for what I believe in. And everyone else is very afraid or has gone over here and there's been a lot of shaming, actually, um, in the doctor community that I move around in. I'm here supporting my patients and what they need. And that doesn't mean that I'm telling people not to get the vaccine at all. I'm giving them informed consent. These are the pros and cons of the vaccine. This is the risk category that you're in. I want you to make the decision that feels right for you. The ethical principle of free and informed medical consent guaranteed by the Nuremberg Code, the Helsinki Declaration, was abandoned. We still know nothing about long-term vaccine harms because the vaccines haven't been out that long. How can we possibly provide informed consent without this information? You can't have informed consent if you don't tell your patients of the risks and benefits. When I emailed Army Public Health Command and asked about adverse events, the epidemiologist told me that they were not tracking, tracing, or monitoring adverse events. I think at the beginning, the vaccines were probably working well enough to make it worth it. And I'm one of these that I'm willing to roll up my sleeve for science. You know, I understand that. I would have liked better informed consent. One of the main side effects that we see is neurological. The reporting and the findings of the adverse effects, the publishing of them is very low. And that is in direct contradiction with what the healthcare people are seeing. And a lot of that is coming from this belief that global vaccination is better than the risk of these adverse events. But I would ask, how do we know that? Public health guidance on this is crystal clear. Even if someone has already had COVID-19 and recovered, vaccination is the safest and most effective way to build a durable immune response that protects you your family, your friends, and your community. We were being told that the vaccine was the only solution and anyone who questioned it was ostracized. But where did that leave people like me who weren't able to get fully vaccinated? Did I need to self-isolate forever? Prevention is a huge part of naturopathic medicine and a huge part of my practice is let's not wait until someone's in the ICU to try to save them. Yeah. Let's do that ahead of time. It was clear that the majority of the people dying of COVID had comorbidities including obesity being a prime risk factor. But not only were there no campaigns to incentivize good health, people were being offered free fast food burgers and fries if they got vaccinated. Did you say free fries when you get vaccinated? Just think of this when you think of vaccination. Mmm. Vaccination. So I've seen hundreds of COVID patients by this time, some of them vaccinated, some of them unvaccinated. Everyone did really well with it, including my own 89-year-old grandmother who actually wasn't vaccinated, but she made it through in a week. 
Over a year after my one Pfizer shot, I contracted COVID. And my bout with COVID was six hours of slightly aching muscles and a mild headache. But while I, a healthy and not fully vaccinated person, hardly noticed that I had COVID, I had fully vaccinated and boosted friends getting extremely sick with it, but still saying things like, thank God I'm vaccinated or it would be way worse. Now, they may be right, but how do they know? I am absolutely exhausted about hearing about vaccinated and unvaccinated. There's only one category you need to care about. It's untreated versus treated. That the FDA and the CDC actually coerce individuals for whom the vaccine is unsafe to receive the vaccine and then incur fatal and non-fatal injuries is, at this point in time, malfeasance. I started hearing highly credentialed doctors talk about possible other ways to treat and prevent COVID. The vaccines were waning, boosters were being pushed, and proven treatments like monoclonal antibodies were not widely available. Doctors were finding that off-label medications were helpful in some circumstances, and then they were prohibited from using them. This censorship was hurting those of us who were vaccine injured because doctors were pressured to push the vaccine and encouraged not to say anything negative. Was it possible that there were other treatments besides the vaccine that could also reduce the risk of extreme COVID? I'm giving high dose IV steroids. I'm giving you know 25 grams of IV vitamin C. I've kept over 2000 people out of the hospital. And if you look at current statistics, 20 of those people should be dead and they're not. I'm having the same experiences that you did with the hospitals. So it's not just you, it's all of us. I'm currently a COVID center and a lot of people call me up. You have to pick up the challenge and help the patient. We have state agencies and hospitals interfering with the sacred patient-physician relationship. For the first time in my entire career, I could not be a doctor. I had seven COVID patients, including a 31-year-old woman. I was not allowed to treat these people. I had to stand by idly. I had to stand by idly watching these people die. I then tried to sue the system, and you know what they did? They then accused me of seven most outrageous crimes that I had committed, ignoring the fact that under my care, the mortality was 50%, those of my colleagues. And the end result was I lost my hospital privilege and was reported to the National Practitioner Data Bank. So here I was standing up for patients' rights and this hospital, this evil hospital, ended my medical career. So that's what they do. Physicians have always been granted discretionary latitude to exercise their own medical judgment. This is the first time in my career I've worried. Is somebody going to be looking over my shoulder asking me why I've prescribed fluvoxamine for this indication rather than that indication. I prescribe it for depression, no problem. Are you giving this to treat COVID? Why should it matter to you? The NIH, the CDC, and the FDA are not involved in medical education. We went through a residency of medical school, a residency program. I've never called the FDA, the NIH, or the CDC for advice. So to have them dictate our medical practices has to stop. Every patient has a slight potential thing that we might do differently. And if we don't do that, we are, not, we are not good doctors. They are afraid to treat us. We have had patients who are severely injured and are dying, who cannot get in the door to get seen by physicians because physicians are afraid of the word COVID vaccine. And it's this looming threat without definition. You're spreading misinformation. Oh, do cite the papers in which I am you know, spreading misinformation. They will not define it. They will attack you. They will threaten you. They will put you in a state of fear and say, you can only do what we say, but don't save a life. These are crimes against humanity. We have patients who are falling ill with a treatable disease and they can't get treatment. When the state are telling doctors that they can't do any doctoring, has misinformation gotten out of control? Today we'll be citing Jay Bhattacharya, 
That old hack from Stanford University, Professor Jay Bhattacharya, says, A proposed California law threatens to make such dissent career-ending by handing the state the power to strip medical licenses from doctors who disagree with government positions on COVID. The bill is motivated by the idea that practicing doctors are spreading misinformation about the risks of COVID, its treatment, and the COVID vaccine. Oh, you doctors. I remember when there was just conspiracy theorists out there, but those conspiracy theorists, so manipulative, they've managed to turn themselves into doctors on the side. It declares that physicians and surgeons who disseminate or promote misinformation or disinformation related to COVID-19, including false or misleading information, who's false? Who's misleading? This is the problem that we're faced with these days, isn't it? The language of the bill itself is intentionally vague about what constitutes misinformation. Doctors, fearing loss of their livelihoods, will need to hew closely to the government line on COVID science and policy, even if that line does not track the scientific evidence. We, ordinary folk, we query whether or not it really is false and misinformation, or if it's just not bloody convenient to their aims, agenda, objectives. I'm so disappointed that we are suppressing knowledge. I am pro-vaccine. My children have been fully vaccinated. Before December 24th, I was running them to football games, baseball games. Um, I started with the numbness and tingling in my fingertips, my toes. Every time I stood up, my heart rate was soaring to like 170, 180. When we're pushing something out that has not had clear FDA approval, has not been through all of those rigorous testings, we have to be open to fallout. A nurse friend of mine who worked in a hospital declared that anyone who was not getting vaccinated should never speak to her again. She said that she'd been putting her life on the line dealing with COVID deaths and she feels personally disrespected if you choose not to get the shot. Of course, I empathize with her. But for every nurse who believes 100% in the vaccines, there are nurses who refuse to get vaccinated so vehemently that they're willing to lose their jobs. Is one nurse telling the truth and the other lying? Or is it possible that there are many different angles to this issue that's strewn as black and white? At work, because you're a nurse, like, do you just not really talk about this because it's kind of controversial type thing? Like, yeah, I mean, like, my coworkers are aware. They know because I have, like, these big bumps that appear on my skin. If the boosters become mandated, where does that leave you? Well, I wouldn't get it. There, no, there's no doubt. Like, why? Why in the world would they ever make you get something that would harm you? And do you have kids? Oh, yes. When you're thinking about all of them getting vaccinated, was that a hard decision? Yeah, I mean, they're old enough to definitely make their own choices, but they watch everything that happened to me and they're like, no way. Let me speak as a pediatrician. You should vaccinate your kids. Benefits of the vaccine clearly outweigh the risks. We looked at the risks of disease, the risks of death, of hospitalizations, of long COVID among children. And importantly, we looked at how well these vaccines work. 91% in, uh, effective against infection. And then, of course, we reviewed the safety data. There were no severe events associated with the safety of this vaccine. There is a disease category upon which the FDA, the CDC, and all stakeholders agree that the vaccines cause and that's myocarditis or heart inflammation. The risks of the vaccines are far greater than the risks of COVID-19, the respiratory illness. I've looked at the myocarditis cases. I'm not very concerned about most of them. Unlike viral myocarditis, we see where there's heart failure. This is a symptomatic mild inflammation that is very transient, goes away very quickly in most kids. I am stunned when I hear people dismiss myocarditis as an acceptable side effect because myocarditis is life-threatening and a life-disabling condition. We don't know the long-term prognosis of vaccine-induced myocarditis, whether heart damage is permanent. We haven't studied the problem long enough. A twinge of chest discomfort, they may go to the hospital, they draw a blood test, they say, oh, well, there's a cardiac enzyme that's a little high. We're going to keep them for observation for a day. They send them home and they tell them to not run a marathon for the next three months. I'm telling you, as a specialist, myocarditis is not mild. I wondered why we're not warned about myocarditis at the time of vaccination. The FDA says you'll recover if you don't exercise for three months. But what happens if someone doesn't know they have it and they don't rest? 
although we can't say with certainty yet that the pediatric cardiologists feel that the chance that this is going to be associated with any kind of lasting uh, effect is extremely small. December 17th, 2020, they did a study and they knew they caused heart conditions in teenagers. Why wasn't this information released until October 1st this year? They need to quit pushing this on their children. A lot was going on right after the shot. I had extreme pain in my shoulder and my elbow, and then all the tingling came in. But I had the sensation that water was running from the corner of my mouth down to the side here, um, my and fingers. The, and the Novocaine, right? Right. It I was like feeling. I had that feeling. The Novocaine gum or mouth. It, it was like coming out of the dentist yeah. or something like that. Holding things is harder than it was before. You had a reaction, and now you have to decide if you're going to give your kids the vaccine. And if you don't, they're not going to school. Although the California school mandate was postponed, many parents had already rushed to vaccinate their children, and the threat still looms. But there was so much information coming out. You need to do it because of this, and you need to not do it because of this. And there was just no way to navigate that. The day before Evie went in for his, I crumpled into a ball in the shower, sobbing. Felt like I had failed my children, that I couldn't protect them. I couldn't see how to protect them. I mean, thank goodness there was no, no reaction like mine. I'm not going to risk my child's health when, if he has reaction, I know he will not be taken seriously. He will not be cared for. He will not be anything. He also won't be able to necessarily tell me how he's feeling differently because he's just turned seven. He actually just got COVID um, last month. He had a mild fever and sluggishness for a few hours. By the time it was bedtime, it was gone. And he was totally normal. If you want to vaccinate your child, fantastic. I don't care. Do whatever you think is right. But I'm not risking my child's safety for something that to me seems completely unnecessary. Overall, I think the potential for benefit of vaccinating children is enormous. But there simply haven't been enough children studied yet to know for sure. I do believe that children at highest risk do need to be vaccinated, but vaccinating all of the children to achieve that seems a bit much for me. So I'm having some challenges with this one. What you're pointing out is if you have something that is very safe and you can administer in a mass vaccination, why wouldn't you do it if you can prevent even, you know, 400 deaths of children a year? Uh, am I understanding that? calculus correctly exactly so children certainly can get this virus i was on service last week we had a child who, who had a pretty severe covid pneumonia and he was really struggling so if this disease can be prevented safely then it, it should be prevented so today i want to look at a study from singapore over a quarter of a million children now 22 of the children suffered a severe uh, adverse reaction to the vaccination. Only five children needed uh, oxygen. And of that five, only four were admitted to intensive care. There was two went to intensive care from the fully vaccinated group and only one uh, from the unvaccinated group. The risk of adverse events is more than four times the risk of the child requiring oxygenation or indeed being admitted to intensive care. The risk benefit analysis has changed. I'm still concerned. What could we find down the road? And do we have to do this again? Did you do it again? In January 2022, I lost a job because I wasn't vaccinated. I had a vax card showing one shot. I had a blood test showing that I still had antibodies and a doctor's exemption. And I was willing to get tested every day. They didn't care. I couldn't go to restaurants, gyms, malls, events. So when the anti-mandate rally came to Los Angeles, I attended it to represent those of us who were suddenly societal outcasts just for doing what the government asked us to do. Even if you fundamentally disagree with someone else's stance, does that justify the lack of compassion for them losing their livelihoods? Through the madness and the lies As they're holding every back the truth Every creed standing here together All we have to do no matter what they try, I will always fight for you. And I have been the lucky recipient of thousands of dollars in medical bills. When I look in the mirror, I don't recognize the woman I see. Once a strong and independent 
an adventure-loving woman is now a woman who can barely stand and breathe. I worked my entire life to get to where I was, financially stable and in a job I loved. But one shot changed it all. It was last year that I received my second Moderna vaccine. Within about 36 hours, I had um, nausea, vomiting, and then it turned into breathing difficulty. The fifth day after the vaccine, ended up in the hospital. And then exactly a week after, I was on the ventilator. They put the trach in because I was having spasms, had neurological issues. That's made it difficult for walking. Um, I've had some doctors look at me and say, yes, we think it's the vaccine. But when you read their documentation, it's very vague. Sometimes I have days where you just think, this is my life. This is baseline, this is the new norm. How do I function and learn to function this way and how do I accept it? And that's difficult at times. President Biden, Fauci, FDA, how many more deaths do you have to be responsible for before you start listening and responding? Social media platforms censor us. Media outlets say we share misinformation when we share our stories. Being vaccine injured, I've seen hate from both sides. The Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. This is not a left issue. This is not a right issue. This is an American issue. This is a global issue. Coming from a healthcare background and being a physical therapist, I believe that the FDA, the CDC, those organizations were there to protect us. And through this entire situation, I have been proven wrong. <laughs> I've had people tell me this is an enlisted reaction from the CDC, so this can't be a reaction. People say coincidence. Well, you know what? This vaccine is a leading cause of coincidence. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel. At the rally, I was surrounded by many people that I disagreed with politically, and that was a new experience for me. I will not give up on you. I will shield you from the I received my second dose of the Pfizer vaccine on January 2nd, and within 10 days, I was paralyzed in the hospital, and I am 19 years old. Since the vaccine, I've had to be on a medical leave from college, so I haven't gone back to it yet. It's hard to even look past getting out of bed to think that I could ever be able to go to college or do that. But I hope that you can feel that I will always fight for you. Originally, my integrative doctor was like, I've seen some people get set back in their Lyme from the vaccine. I don't know if it's a good idea for you. She actually got threats from the government, like telling her, like, if you tell people not to get it or write exemptions or any of this, like, you are going to lose your license and your practice will be shut down. We all handled it fine. So when she said she was going to get it, I didn't discourage her. My neurologist and my primary doctor that I've seen since I was a kid were like pushing me to get it. They were like, you'll be fine. You won't have a reaction. It's totally safe. Just get it. I got the second shot and I was in the bathroom and all of a sudden it felt like shooting fire, like stabbing pains, like flying down my legs. Everything in my body was like cramping up and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like I'm on the toilet right now. <laughs> and, and so I had to call both of them in because like I was stuck. So they admitted me and they still couldn't figure out what was happening and I couldn't move anything from the waist down. The nurses told me there are kids here that are going through the exact same thing that happened to you that has either been sick from COVID or got the vaccine. And then I'd ask the doctors and they'd say, no, there's not. What was the, what was the thing that she wanted to say that I had? Conversion. Conversion disorder. disorder. The doctor that was in charge of the rehabilitation center, his assistant said that he thought it was the vaccine and that he was gonna give me a medical exemption for the booster. And he came in my room on the last day and told me that they weren't giving me a medical exemption from it, that they can't classify it as that. This is Riley, she's also vaccine injured. She's eight.
that there was slave for an effective vaccine. Seven months later, FEMA contacted me and asked me to change the cause of death to my son to COVID so that they could help me financially. I told them I would never do that. Autopsy report, death certificate, badge card, I have everything with me all the time. And the death certificate's clear, huh? Like, yeah. yeah. Well, I have the actual death certificate. Yeah. Wow. His actual, the copy of his badge card, birth certificate. Do you do that because you know people question you, or? No, I do. I always keep just... my son's information, and then I figure if eventually I run into the right person uh-huh. that's going to try to help me, uh, they're going to ask me, "Why don't you take any paperwork with you?" I got it with me. I said, "You know what? I'll, I'm just tired." I was thinking about giving up. I don't want to go nowhere. I don't want to speak no more. I just stay at home, you know. And then uh, I was going through my file cabinet, and I found a Father's Day card that he gave me a couple years ago. And I just cried for about two, three, maybe more, I don't know, hours. And uh, I said, I believe it's my son telling me to keep fighting. Because I guess, he, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about giving up. I need to keep fighting. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Thank you for being there every day with me and when I needed you the most. You gave me whatever I wanted, even thought I was spoiled. There's no possible way to pay you back for all the things you've done for me. I am really lucky to have you as my dad. Also, if you can't read this, it's because it's 3.45 in the morning and I am really tired. Love you. From Junior. of a vaccine injury from the vaccine that I took on 1-5-2021. Three days later, these symptoms that you see right now started. When I got to the hospital, there was a doctor in my room, and he said, I know this is from the vaccine, and we're not going to stop until we get you right. I never saw that doctor in my room again. The nurses would run down to my room because they could hear my bed shaking from the nurse's station. Well, after the fifth day, they told me that my insurance had denied my entire stay because the only thing they submitted was bilateral leg weakness. My bill is over $60,000. I have no income. My, I have my husband. I mean, he's supporting us. We have become our own doctors and researchers because the CDC or the NIH will not acknowledge us. If you end up like us, there is no medical help for you. And there sure isn't any financial help for you at all either. The day I took my shot, I was functioning, I was healthy, I was happy. And four days later, I can't walk. Nobody knows what to do with me with us. Nobody. I've spent so much money and then when you meet someone that says, oh, well, this works for me, me, and then you do it, it doesn't work for you. It's hard enough to like go, why does it work for you and not for me, you know? So then in June, June my speech started going out, not being able to, to walk right, I'm having tremor, tremors on my fingers. There's a lot of people that, that, that are out there that are like me. I've actually been eight weeks symptom free. I don't know how long that's going to last. Um, I don't. I don't know. Angelia was so excited because it had been like six or seven weeks with no symptoms. Had an episode today and just balled up, and that was really sad to see. Was that Angelia? That's so, so she's not doing well.
For the first time, hanging out with a bunch of vaccine injured people is wild. To be around so many people who have had the same experience as me, the same experience in terms of like people not wanting to listen. And You're on WNYC. Hi, Roger. Hey, good morning. A builder here for about 20 years. It's trucking, it's labor, it's logistics. Another thing, two of my guys, one guy 28 years old, another 42 years old. One has a heart attack after his second vax. The other has a stroke. I'm missing labor. I can't find people to work. Roger, thank you very much. I'll take your stories about prices on face value, but not your medical disinformation, trying to lay somebody's heart attack at the feet of vaccination and imply, therefore, that vaccination is more dangerous than not getting vaccinated, which it is not. Uh, but, but how about on the inflation numbers in the construction industry? We are being so censored that we can't get the message out that we're even being censored because if it's through social media, they are one of the platforms that is censoring us. And even if it's not outwardly, we're being shadow banned, which is a new word to me. So you could share something, but nobody acknowledges it. And you're thinking, oh, I'm isolated and I'm alone, but they're probably not seeing it. It's been moved to the bottom of the timeline or it's, it's non-existent. You literally cannot post on social media about having a vaccine reaction without it being censored. Or TikTok taking away our, shadow banning our accounts. Facebook, TikTok, whatever, you mention the vaccine, you're gonna get like some kind of warning or some kind of, well, for va COVID vaccine information, click this link. So I got your information. Your information is not correct. It's not safe for everybody. And you're giving out this disinformation all the time that could cost someone their life. I don't know how you can function. It's just not honest. I mean. What's the rationale for this? What's the reason for saying, oh, be skeptical about the vaccine? As somebody who has given the last 17 years of my life to helping other people and health and wellness, to then have no one recognize and now censor the fact that I got sick and many other people are getting sick. When I decided to make this movie, I made a pitch video that I shared privately and selectively on the platform Vimeo. I talked about my reaction and the need for compassion. It was removed for misinformation. They said they don't allow content that goes against the CDC recommendations. I am not allowed to tell my own story. Everything's hidden and dark and taken down and removed and you can't say this and don't do this. What is this about? The vaccines we have now, which are incredibly safe and effective. Anyone who isn't on board with that is not uh, participating in the best citizenship. I wanted to believe that the vaccine was the way out, but the more I saw points of view not being heard, and the more I heard the phrase safe and effective, with no one talking about people who were injured from the vaccine, the more I started to doubt the narrative. I am telling you, as an epidemiologist, the vaccines are causing these fatal and non-fatal events. Follow the science is a slogan, yet there are very highly credentialed scientists and doctors who've been labeled as crazy and deplatformed. Well, I do have some credibility here because I did create this technology. Why are we not allowed to even hear their ideas? If the benefit so clearly outweighs the risk, what's the problem with healthy opposition? I'm really tired of watching the U.S. health system's failed response to this pandemic. After I reported to my command my concerns that in one morning I had to ground three out of three pilots due to vaccine injuries, my charts were pulled for review, and I was told that I would not be seeing acute patients anymore. I understand that this is new and information is changing, and it's okay to be wrong sometimes. But there was a clear narrative that only supported one mainstream belief and declared any other ideas were wrong. It's a great vaccine, it's a safe vaccine, and it's uh, something that works. This is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Over the last four weeks in the UK, 78% of those that have died with the Delta variant from COVID have been fully vaccinated. Vaccinated people do not carry the virus, don't get sick. When people are vaccinated, they can feel safe that they are not going to get infected. I'm saddened that we are super saturated as a society right now in the attitude of everybody knows that has shut down intellectual curiosity. Now we know that the vaccines work well enough that the virus stops with every vaccinated person. 
there's something not adding up, and we should all be asking, is it true that this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated? This is a paper from FDA that just came out in the last week or so. They've said there's at least at least a 16% non-capture of people who were vaccinated but are being called unvaccinated. That means that all the data where they, they, so they, they've got vaccinated here and unvaccinated here, you've got 16% who are wrong in the wrong place. That means you've got a 32% imbalance is swinging in the wrong way. FDA have just admitted that. When you look at the viral load in the nasopharynx, it was decreased fourfold for those who actually were within 12 to 28 days of the first dose of vaccine. Bottom line, the vaccines work in the real world. This is basic immunology. If you get a shot in your arm, you don't have a tendency to, you, everybody hears about antibodies, but there's a special kind in your tears, your nose, your mouth called secretory IgA. It's little mops in your tears. If you've had a natural infection, you have high levels of secretory IgA, these little mops in your mucosal membranes. From the vaccine, you don't get this physiologically. So we are seeing actually the vaccinated carry a high volume of virus because they don't have this secretory IgA. So this false construct from our federal agencies that this is a pandemic and the unvaccinated are spreading, is a pathophysiologic lie. The vaccinated are carrying high volumes in their nose, their tears, their mouth of virus because the vaccine does not neutralize in that location of the body where the virus comes in. If you look at the level of virus in the nasopharynx of a person who's vaccinated and compare that to the level of virus in the nasopharynx of an unvaccinated person who's infected, they're essentially equivalent. Vaccinated people are clearly capable of transmitting the infection to an uninfected person. It's kind of strange that we, this meeting has to take place in the U.S. Senate. In the past, we would think that somehow the FDA, the CDC, the NIH, we would have basically maybe a message board, exchange ideas. The extreme censorships and attacks have have led us to come to this place. We invited them all here, the heads of the CDC, Secretary of Defense Austin, Secretary of Labor Walsh, Secretary of Transportation Buttigieg, FDA Acting Commissioner Woodcock, HHA Secretary Becerra, NAIAD Director Fauci, NIH Director Collins, together with the CEOs of Johnson Johnson, Moderna, Pfizer, and BioNTech. None of them showed up. We invited mainstream media, and of course they didn't show up. And if you go to YouTube to watch the six-hour Senate panel where these doctors and scientists got together with the vaccine injured, the video has been taken down for misinformation. I know many mainstream scientists who, similar to me, think that the current narrative is extreme and wrong. But very few of them are willing to speak up. Any attempt to deviate from the main narrative today is faced with a wall of hostility and even elimination. As a scientist, it's quite baffling to me that we have an avalanche of data showing that it's the spike protein that causes the deleterious effects of COVID. But we don't see any problem with putting genetic material into the cells of our body that tell it to make tons and tons of spike protein. Before I got vaccinated, I had seen this interview with a scientist declaring that there was too much we didn't know about COVID to inject the spike protein into our bodies like we do with the vaccine. He talked about this mysterious long COVID syndrome that we couldn't explain and that seemed to have something to do with the spike protein of the coronavirus making its way into various organs of the body. Ginsha lab at Georgetown showed the spike protein signals through the ACE2 receptor, which usually doesn't signal at all, and that leads to pulmonary hypertension. This is causing inflammation. The Bristol Medical Center in the UK showed that the spike protein severely disrupts the functions of cells that support the heart. I've since learned that the adverse reactions to the vaccine are similar to the COVID long hauler symptoms. Could this circle back to the spike protein? Lee and all out of Hong Kong demonstrated the antibodies um, made to the spike protein cross-react with our own tissues so that many people, when they make antibodies to the spike protein, they're getting an autoimmune response that can be devastating. We know the spike protein is toxic. Why are we having our bodies make it? Me and my co-authors pointed out that when you look on national emergency services calls in Israel for cardiac arrest among young individuals under 40, you see a dramatic increase of 25% in these calls 
parallel to the vaccination campaign in Israel in early 2021, not claiming that there is a causal effect. We don't have a proof for that. But we did raise the concern. We never got a response from the authorities. And in fact, they went public and called this research fake. I'm a believer in medicine. Me and my children are fully vaccinated with traditional vaccines, and I'm personally vaccinated uh, with the Moderna vaccine. The fight of this virus requires collective humility, empathy, and having science on our side. I'm very concerned that we lost all of these in the last 18 months. I'm a 51-year-old research nurse practitioner. I have four degrees. Medicine is my second career. I'm pro-patient, pro-science, and I've been fiercely pro-vaccine my entire life, often having fights with family members to get vaccinated. Prior to December 29th, 2020, I was a vibrant, compassionate, healthy person. Immediately after dose one, I developed paresthesias in my right arm. The numbness and tingling traveled to my right side of my face, my eye, and my ear. I saw a neurologist, one of the top neurologists in New York City. He said, oh, if it subsides, get the second shot. We just don't know. It's all new. Those two set me into a tailspin. Within four days, I developed debilitating tinnitus. The month of February, curled up in the fetal position on the bathroom floor, wondering how will I ever live with this? It was so severe, couldn't hear TV, couldn't watch, uh, listen to music or read a book or hear what other people were saying. I offered up quickly. I think I'm having a reaction to the vaccine. I was quickly dismissed by a physician who had no knowledge about these vaccine reactions, and I was sent home with ibuprofen. By August, I literally exploded in generalized body neuropathies, stinging in my hands and feet, burning in the soles of my feet, prickling all over like I fell in a bush of nettles. Feeling so alone and so scared, I turned to social media because I couldn't find anybody. I set up a tinnitus group, 3,500 members joining in months. I started to help them as a nurse. It was the best way I could help. Helping the people who had no insurance understand what their labs were, people who had no money, guiding them what tests they should get, how best to use their money. Social media, you're there, you're looking for support, you find support. They suddenly tag you, you're an anti-vaxxer. I couldn't get anybody to take an interest in me. I'm a researcher, I found that curious. Here I am presenting, unusual case, study me. Reactions are real. They're a part of science. I got unlucky. But the real tragedy is not only the lack of adequate medical support, but the active and coordinated denial of our situations. The impact on my medical career, which I love and work so hard for, is immeasurable. I will continue to fight. <laughs> I will continue to research. I will find an answer for people. Or I will die trying. Thank you for your time. FDA, NIH, you are not taking care of those who suffer severe adverse reactions. Stop telling the public that you are. Take responsibility for your role in the suffering of good Americans who did their part by taking the vaccine and had no idea this could happen to them. America wants to see FDA listen not only to vaccine injured patients, but also to scientists who started to figure out this months and months ago. Establish ICD-10 and CPT codes. Release the NIH study on injuries. So we reached out to the NIH essentially to report this injury. They took it very seriously. We had a telehealth within a couple of days. It, it turned into a cascade of patients, tens of thousands possibly. So they picked who they wanted to bring out. Then we did follow up for several weeks. We were supposed to go back out in September and our follow up appointments got canceled. So maybe they said, fine, these guys and gals have recovered. We're done and no more need to follow up. Yeah, it was just radio silence, and I got an email from NAF in December. He said, we're not studying this. Stop sending people this way. So they knew that we were not 100% recovered. The study came out. It became such a big buzz. This is their first study, and they are talking about the vaccine injury for the first time ever. Somebody from the government organization is actually presenting a study, and they're saying everybody recovered. And, this is right? what so cure I... looks like, so... 
Is it right. possible again? We don't have the rest of the patients. Do you think that they are feeling better? Is it that you are an exception and you're not feeling better, but others have? I know at least half of the participants in this study, and none of them are better. If they would have recognized these situations earlier, insurance systems would have been able to start covering them. Even if we just know this is a side effect that is recognized. We also had the wrong bodies leading the vaccine program. Remember, the FDA is supposed to be the safety watchdog. The National Institutes of Health is the government research body, and the CDC is the outbreak investigation body. Right now, the CDC and the FDA are the named sponsors of a vaccine program. If Americans can learn anything, we should never have the FDA and CDC be a sponsor of a public program in administering a product. Specifically, the NAIAD division of the NIH co-owns the patent on the Moderna vaccine. Four members get royalties from the profits into their personal pockets, not to mention the, the entire budget of that program. It's publicly available information. We should insist on independent data analysis by investigators who are not employed by the, the vaccine manufacturers. In 1992, Congress passed the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. With the act, the FDA moved from a fully taxpayer-funded entity to one funded through tax dollars and new prescription drug user fees. Manufacturers pay these fees when submitting applications to the FDA for drug review and annual user fees based on the number of approved drugs they have on the market. Can you see any potential problems in the FDA being funded by the big pharma companies that it's regulating? In 2016, a study found that 15 of the 26 employees who left the agency later worked or consulted for the biopharmaceutical industry. Many of the physicians, caregivers and other witnesses before FDA advisory panels that evaluate drugs receive consulting fees, expense payments or other remunerations from pharma companies. This is a chronicle of several examples of the CDC putting forth scientific studies that were just really fundamentally flawed. An example is the risk of diabetes in kids who have recovered from a SARS-CoV-2 infection. But it made a huge error, which was it didn't even adjust for BMI. That kids who may be overweight have medical problems might be slightly more likely to get SARS-CoV-2. They may also be more likely to develop diabetes because they're slightly overweight. You should at least compare them to people who didn't get COVID who are of the same sorts of characteristics to isolate the effect of COVID. Now, this occurred at a time when the CDC had a policy goal to get 5 to 11-year-olds vaccinated. Now, we have an agency that has, on a number of occasions, pushed bad science. I mean, science that I just don't believe is convincing as somebody who spends a lot of time reading science and thinking about it. You cannot do science differently because you want people to do something. Some patients may be afraid of taking opioids because they're perceived as too strong or addictive, but that is far from actual fact. Less than 1% of patients taking opioids actually become addicted. Doctors across the country should have been humbled when medical schools taught them the lessons learned from drugs like thalidomide and DES. DES was a synthetic estrogen given to women without problem. They had children, but the daughters of mothers who took DES got to be about 18 to 20 years old, and they developed rare genital cancers and infertility at an alarming rate. It took 40 years for the medical establishment to figure out that DES caused transgenerational infertility and cancers. And this was a drug that went through standard clinical trials. On August 6, 2003, my husband of almost 10 years was found hanging from the rafters of our garage, dead at age 37. He had just started his dream job and was having difficulty sleeping, which is not uncommon for entrepreneurs. So he went to his doctor and was given the antidepressant Zoloft off-label for insomnia. Five weeks later, Woody took his own life. How many lives were destroyed and families torn apart before the FDA finally warned about the link between suicide and SSRIs? It is mind-boggling to me when you put a product out in the world, especially one that's been rushed through testing, that the FDA and other regulatory agencies wouldn't establish a robust, proactive safety monitoring program as part of the rollout. In August 2021, the top two officials of the FDA, Philip Krauss and Marion Gruber, resigned because of the pressure from the White House to approve boosters. This was big news. Why weren't more people talking about this? On February 7th, 2022, 
The Department of Homeland Security changed their definition of terrorism to the proliferation of false or misleading narratives which sow discord or undermine public trust in U.S. government institutions. For example, there is widespread online proliferation of false or misleading narratives regarding COVID-19. Why weren't more people questioning this? A prominent scientist who experienced severe tinnitus after his vaccination was in direct communication with the CDC in regards to them recognizing this reaction, but they stopped responding. Then someone sent him a leaked CDC email saying, thank him for his email and cut him off. What are we supposed to do? So over the last 11 months since our first suicide, we've had 20 that I know of. The first victim that we had almost a year ago now, a mother of one, and she was a long hauler. She was 75% better. And then she uh, got the vaccine, hoping that it would get her all the way back to 100%, and it took her down to 15%. And so she suffered for a long time with the electric shocks and the neuropathy. So since then, we've had a lot more suicides. People just have had a similar problem. Either it's the neuropathy, the vibrations, or the tinnitus. A mother of four, she sent me a message saying, you know, my husband doesn't believe me. He doesn't support me. I'm not getting any help from my doctors. I don't know how I'm going to live with this for the next 40 years. We had three in two weeks, she was the third. I don't think people realize how debilitating the symptoms are. My husband couldn't leave me alone for months. He'd leave the house and he didn't know if he was gonna come home to a wife that was alive. He was afraid every moment of every day. And it seeped into our kids' lives. Six months, I was not a mom, I was not a human, I was just there. I was gonna drive down to the lake and I was gonna carbon monoxide my car and I was gonna put AstraZeneca did this on a sign in the window. And uh, I was too sick to do it. It's the only reason I'm alive is because I was too sick to do it. I would like to finish with a letter from a friend. Bree, I cannot take this any longer. This has taken everything away from me. My career, my family, my life. My body will not stop attacking itself. And this is beyond the worst amount of torture. Please accept my apologies. I must bid farewell to this world. Please make sure the world knows the cruelty that has been imposed upon us. Goodbye, my dear friend. I will see you on the flip side. Rochelle Walensky, Janet Woodcock, Peter Marks, Anthony Fauci, you erased her and the many others like her. Their blood is on your hands. You cannot bring my friends back, but you can save others from their fate if you finally just tell the truth. I'm afraid that there's been so much energy put into declaring one solution that we may have missed crucial opportunities to ask questions. I understand things aren't always black and white. I'm less concerned with having the right or wrong answers. My concern is having the right questions. I'm probably on the opposite side of the political stage as, as most of you out here, but I don't, this isn't about politics anymore. And actually, I was a little afraid to come, knowing that you know, I would probably be in a sea of people who think differently than me, but I think that's the problem. The problem is they're tearing us apart. Sorry. <laughs> this is hard, and this is lonely, as the country is trying to divide us blue and red, vaccinated and unvaccinated. I am wearing purple here today because purple is the combination of blue and red. We need humanity back. It's a mess. I don't know how even if your movie will weave its way, right? Because the skepticism is already stacked against us. My vaccine injury journey has been interesting. 
I find myself on the same side of this particular issue as conservative people whom I have vehemently disagreed with my entire life. All of my friends that are like democratic, they like just, again, like don't want to talk about it at all. And it's very like disheartening. When that is the only side that will listen to you, we are growing further segmented. When I try to tell people, they don't know how to receive it. Because no one wants to be told that everything they believe could possibly not be 100% true. I feel like my world has opened to how closed-minded I might have been before this. Let's forget left versus right, red versus blue, vaxxed versus unvaxxed. I lean liberal, but I've, I've voted conservative on some things. I would have considered myself more towards the Republican side, but with some liberal views. <laughs> There's actually a very large group of us in the middle who don't feel the need to label ourselves. We don't have to hate each other. We just need to have an open dialogue again. Like, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. And in this middle ground, I've encountered a humanity that acknowledges people suffering from this vaccine who desperately need help. And a humanity that isn't afraid to question the regulators and the people who are profiting. We must be seen believed and helped. Our stories are anecdotal, but in a situation where the science is changing, the studies are flawed, and political agendas regulate, anecdotes could quite possibly be the most reliable data that we have. Yes, we are anecdotals, and these are our stories. Through the madness and the lies As they're holding back the truth no matter what they try, I will always fight for you. Our Savior in a sense, they are trying to remove. I am here at your defense and I will always fight for you. Yes, I will always fight for you. I will stand here in the way. And I will not give up on you. I will shield you from the pain. In the battle on the field, there is evil on the move. But I hope that you can feel that I will always fight for you. In the darkness of the times, there's a light that shines the proof. It'll soon reveal the crime, so I won't stop this fight for you. 